Chapter 16, The Smiling Saint Not so long ago, it was the fashion, when writing the lives of the saints, to gloss over and suppress their more human qualities. The saints lost much of their attraction when they were thus portrayed or charactered as devoid of all human feelings, reserved, withdrawn, austere, lacking in warmth and reality. This was not only unfortunate, but it gave a completely false orientation to the whole concept of sanctity. People tried to imitate the saints they found in books, found it too difficult, and quickly gave up the attempt. But the whole Christian tradition is precisely the opposite. There is no basic contradiction between holiness and hilarity, and a happy, smiling saint is certainly more attractive than one who is long-faced and cheerless. In quotes, happiness and holiness are, as it were, two inseparable sisters, observes Father Lament, a most experienced director of souls, and elsewhere he adds, God has joined together happiness and holiness in such wise that his graces not only sanctify the soul, but also console it and fill it with peace and sweetness, end quotes. It may be objected that not a few of the early Christian fathers were somewhat gloomy in their outlook and frowned upon undue cheerfulness. But before long, there was a healthy reaction against this viewpoint. From about the year 400 AD to the time of Gregory the Great, eight capital sins were usually enumerated. But St. Gregory had a titty mind and thought that eight were too many. Perhaps he reflected that seven was an easier number for Christians to remember. After all, it had a tradition— there were seven sacraments, seven gifts of the Holy Ghost. The ancients spoke of the seven wonders of the world. There were seven deacons in the early church, seven champions of Christendom. So St. Gregory decided that in future, there should be only seven capital sins. He drew his pen through the eighth deadly sin, which was tristia, or sadness. In quotes, Sadness is the devil's greatest ally, said St. Philip Neri, and the road that leads to heaven is really the road of happiness. End quotes. It is a solitary reminder that sadness was once considered a capital sin. In Holy Scripture, there are far more references to joy and gladness than there are to grief and misery. St. Paul wrote inspiringly, in quotes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. To the Corinthians, he gave the encouraging message that God loveth a cheerful giver. In his great monastic rule, St. Benedict wrote a lovely sentence, in quotes, No one should be sad in the house of God, end quotes advice subsequently copied by other religious founders. The true tradition of Christian asceticism therefore lays stress on the humanity of the saints, especially on their happy disposition. Grace does not destroy the natural gifts. It cleanses them, purifies them from human imperfections, and uses them as a foundation for sanctity. In quotes, We imagine that a man must pass a sad and melancholy existence when he gives himself to recollection in the interior life, says Father Lament again. The very reverse is the case. Happiness, even on this earth, consists in possessing God, and the more we renounce ourselves to unite ourselves with God, the more we cease to be miserable, and the more happy we become. End quotes. The devil has no more redoubtable nor more fatal snare than that of making some form of Phariseeism pass from the holiness required by the gospel, says Dom Columba Mariam. In this way, the prince of darkness even attacks souls seeking after perfection. He darkens the eyes of their souls by the appearance of an altogether formal virtual substitute for the truth of the gospel. End quotes. There is a cold, severe asceticism devoid of humanity, says another spiritual writer, and such ascetics as a rule are not canonized. And there is an asceticism proceeding even to extremes of austerity, which is lit up, warmed, and made attractive by a rich humanity which attracts and inspires. Such is the asceticism of the saints. The holiness of the saints is often enlivened by a saving sense of humor. This is not surprising. Basically, it is a spiritual protection against the sin of pride. A proud man is, as a rule, completely devoid of humor. He takes himself and his concerns much too seriously. The humble man, who is blessed with a sense of humor, is safeguarded from the pitfalls of the proud. St. Teresa, whose voluminous letters scintillate with delicious humor, used to say, in quotes, From sour-faced saints in silly devotions, O Lord, deliver us. St. Francis de Sales, St. Philip Neri, St. John Bosco are but three saints whose lives abound with examples of their cheerfulness in the most difficult situations. St. Philip Neri once visited a convent where a certain sister had a reputation for sanctity. In the parlor, he pretended to be unmannerly, and stretching out his legs, desired the sister to take off his muddy boots. When she flaunts in indignity out of the room, the saint concluded that she was lacking in humility. He was sent to another convent on a similar mission to examine the alleged holiness of a sister. He asked the whole community to be assembled before him, and then he asked bluntly, Which of you is the saint? 
When the reputed saint stepped forward, St. Philip Neri took one sharp look at her and left abruptly, his mission fulfilled. By way of contrast, a woman called at the convent where St. Catherine de Ricci lived and asked if she could see the saint. St. Catherine answered briskly, The saints are all in heaven, there are no saints here. Gabriel's impetual good humor was of the quite subdued type, but it was quite unmistakable. It was, in fact, a lifelong gift. His sunny smile was a feature of his personality, and only in rare moments of crisis was it missing from his lips. While he was still at home, wrote Bonachia, who knew him intimately in those days, his brow was ever serene and unclouded. His look, his smile, the very tone of his voice all revealed a heart in which joy predominated. End quotes. At home, he was a merry boy. At college, a cheerful, lighthearted student who played practical jokes on his friends. Those who remembered him best recalled that he was always happy, always smiling, never in bad humor. How keenly he enjoyed the hidden humor of his last public appearance at Spoleto before he left next day to enter the novitiate. It is no small matter to live in a monastery or in a congregation and to converse therein without reproof, said Thomas Akempis. Here, men are tried as gold in the furnace. Gabriel's gentle smile carried him through the trying days that come to all in the religious life. He was the delight of his brethren, said Father Bernard Mary. Anyone who had to deal with him was astonished at his unruffled disposition, joined as it was to a most amiable manner. Father Francis Xavier, who spent five years with him as a novice and fellow student, confessed, I well remember that I often took a delight in teasing him, but his invariable reaction was a quiet smile. One proof of his unfailing good humor was that Gabriel was never heard to complain, even when things were amiss. Apparently, the food at Isola was fairly rough and ready, and occasionally caused caustic comment. It is true that monastic fare would not be approved by a gourmet, but at the same time, if meals are poor, there is no reason why they should be unplateable. It costs no more to prepare food well than to cook it badly. Where young religious are concerned, well-cooked and nourishing meals are an obvious necessity. St. Paul the Cross held strong views about this and gave precise directions in his rule. In quotes, The superior shall take care that the food be prepared with attentive charity, he enjoined, and that the wants of each be prudently supplied. Let everything in the kitchen be done with charity and cleanliness, so as not to be offensive to the senses or stomach. End quotes. Unfortunately, practice did not always correspond with theory, and at Isola in those days, there was room for a legitimate complaint. Gabriel was one of the few to maintain a discreet silence. In quotes, Never did he complain of the quality or style of the food, said a companion, nor did he speak ill of the cook or murmur against the superior, but always seemed to be satisfied. End quotes. Once the supper was unusually scanty, and a student afterwards remarked that they got very little in the refectory that night. Gabriel's good-humored Sally restored his equanimity. Brother dear, he smiled, what have we got to complain about? After all, everybody got something. That Gabriel had special difficulty about food is clear from several resolutions he made at this time. For example, in quotes, not to speak about food or meals, much less to murmur or complain about them, to cut short at once all thoughts about food. Not to eat greedily or quickly, but modestly and with sobriety, not allowing my appetite to rule me. Not to eat outside mealtime, to be content with my portion, and not to complain in thought or word, remembering that I have made a vow of poverty and that the Lord allows these things to try me, not to take too much. End quotes. The resolutions reflected his interior sentiments. Having taken a vow of poverty, he was happy to suffer the effects of poverty. End quotes. We profess to be poor, he declared, and therefore we should act like poor men. Otherwise, our poverty is only make believe and pretense. The poor often lack the necessities of life. We should make this sacrifice readily and voluntarily. If the poor had all that we have, they'd never complain. They'd think that we were really well off. End quotes. His own experience in the monastery increased his understanding of the plight of the poor. In almost every letter home, he reminds his father to be good to the poor and to help them. In quotes, I recommend the poor to you, reminding you that I too am poor, and therefore possess nothing of my own, not even a glass of water. Yet I want for nothing, on the contrary, I have over and above what I need, and have every convenience. I am very happy, and I bless the hour when I entered this holy congregation. End quotes. One endearing little weakness came to light, although how it became known is rather a mystery, for Gabriel never spoke of it. From the time he was a small boy, he had a sweet tooth and a special liking for sweet cake. On great feast days, a plate of cake was passed around the refectory. Gabriel took his portion, with the rest, but never betrayed his particular fondness for this delicacy. Curiously enough, Gabriel shared this taste with St. Francis of Assisi, of whom a homely incident is recorded which has always embarrassed his more pious biographers. 
The saint was dying when he remembered an old friend, the Lady Giacoma, who lived in Rome. Almost at death's door, he wrote a charming little note asking her to come to see him. My dear good friend, he wrote, I am near the end of my poor life, and I should so much like to see you again before I die. Would you bring with you some sheets for my shroud, some candles to burn around my corpse, and a few of the little sugar cakes you used to make for me so long ago, so that the body may share the present joy of the soul? If so terrific a saint as St. Francis of Assisi enjoyed his sugar cakes, who would grudge the youthful Gabriel such a simple pleasure? Quite indifferent to his own likes and dislikes, Gabriel made sure that, where others were concerned, they should lack for nothing. As a little treat one day, Father Norbert distributed cherries to the students, one of whom was absent. Gabriel at once claimed a portion for the missing student and smilingly handed it to him on his return. In the refectory, someone was occasionally passed over by accident during the serving of the meal. Gabriel was on tender hooks until the omission was rectified. If he failed to catch the server's attention, he would leave his place for permission to bring in the mission portion. His pleased smile as he returned from the kitchen showed how delighted he was to perform a small service for one of his brethren. Gabriel was always concerned when a fellow student was corrected or given a penance for a fault. As a little boy at home, he successfully interceded for his brothers. In the same eager way, now he approached the superior to plead the cause of a brother in religion. If his intervention was unveiling and the superior remained adamant, Gabriel played his trump card. If only the other student were pardoned, he offered to perform the penance himself. Sometimes he was taken at his word and his offer put to the test. But once Father Norbert, nettled by his persistence, spoke very sharply to him about it. Father Gabriel, he said severely, you are a perfect little busybody. Why can't you mind your own business? Gabriel's deep interior happiness was a direct result of the completeness of his sacrifice. He had no regrets, no misgivings, no wish to be elsewhere. In quotes, Thanks be to Jesus and Mary, I live a most happy life. I bless the day and the hour when Jesus and Mary deigned to turn their merciful glance upon me, and through no merit of my own took particular care of me. End quotes. To an unsympathetic observer, his existence might seem drab and monotous, devoid of all that can make life happy or even tolerable. For him, the hard bed, the broken sleep, the poor food, the rough habit, the bare feet, there was no concession to human weaknesses. Yet he cast no backward glance at the world he had long since abandoned, nor had he any desire to taste again the joys that had once seemed so sweet and satisfying. In quotes, How poor this world seems to me, he cried, now that I have contemplated the beauty of heaven. This bodily discomfort, this unrelenting austerity, was part of the price that had to be paid for freedom of the spirit, for true peace of soul. Gabriel paid it gladly and with a will. No longer tied down by the imperious needs of the body, his soul was free to soar towards God on the wings of faith and love. This was the hidden source of his unruffled happiness, the secret hidden behind his smile, to remember at nightfall that, in quotes, he had spent the whole day in the service of the Lord, end quotes. Repeatedly, he told his father that he had never been so happy as when he entered religion, whereas he said, in quotes, by God's mercy, we enjoy that true peace that comes only from God's grace, end quotes. Everything in the religious life enchanted him, enthralled him, filled his heart with almost inexpressible joy. With the passing of the years, his happiness grew deeper and more all-embracing. After three years with the Passionist, he can write with undiminished enthusiasm, in quotes, A soul very dear to God once said, If people in the world only knew the peace, the calm, the blessings of the religious state, monasteries would become as thickly populated as cities, and cities would be deserted. My fellow students often say, How sweet it is to serve God and His Blessed Mother. There is more sweet satisfaction gained from an hour's solitary prayer in the presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament and of His Holy Mother than in the whole evening spent at the theater or in a brightly lit drawing room in Miss worldly amusements in carefree company. None of this can ever satisfy the hunger of the heart. How much more pleasant to take a short walk all alone in the cloister, knowing that Mary, the queen of the true lover of our souls, is watching over us, than to take part in the gay excursions of the world. Such pleasures leave the heart empty with an emptiness that the world can never fill. And when evening comes, what consolation for religious to remember that by God's mercy he has spent the whole day in the service of the good Lord, a Lord who generously rewards those who serve him. A Lord who will not leave without recompense even a straw picked from the ground for love of him. How consoling a thought for him, I repeat, when he throws himself down at night to rest on his poor bed and to rise a little later to sing the praises of the Lord. Finally, what makes the yoke of the Lord so joyful, sweet, and light to bear? Is it not the hope that someday or other, freed from this poor body, 
with no regret for earthly goods, for children, or for aught left behind, we may pass from this world to rejoice in God for the endless ages of eternity? Only one who was truly happy in the life he had chosen could write with such transparent sincerity. If he had one regret, it was that his father had never seen him in the passionist habit. Michael had come to see him at Pervertina, and Pacifica, he had seen his sister at Fermo, but his father never. Cygnus had made it impossible for Sante Pacenti to venture to remote Isola, and Gabriel resigned to the fact that he would never see him again. He makes but a passing reference in a letter, and quotes, Dear father, how often have you told me of your wish to retire to a monastery? Even now you can turn your home into a house of holiness. If you seize the opportunity, the thing can be done quite easily, for divine providence has arranged everything very well. If you do so, you will lead a happy life, well suited to your old age. If we can never see each other again in this life, we may both place our hopes in Jesus and Mary. I shall be doing penance for my past sins. You will be amassing treasure for the next life. Then at length, we shall meet again on that dreaded day of general judgment, but we shall all be together on the right side under Mary's mantle. End quotes. It may be taken for granted that the students discussed Gabriel amongst themselves. Sometimes one came to him personally to check on what he had heard. A companion once asked him, was it really true that he would have climbed Grand Sasso, as Father Norbert had once jokingly told him to do? With the utmost simplicity, Gabriel answered that he would have at least tried to climb the mountain had Father Norbert not told him he wasn't serious about it. His spirit of blind obedience made him ready to execute a command instantly, even when it was obviously not meant to be taken literally. Once, when things had gone wrong and Gabriel, rightly or wrongly, was blamed for the resulting confusion, Father Norbert, who lost no opportunity to mortify him, snapped, You're an absolute good for nothing. You should go to mind the sheep. Without another word, Gabriel rose, genuflected respectfully to ask permission, and was on his way out to the fields when Father Norbert relented and recalled him. Gabriel's unfailing cheerfulness made him an ever-welcome companion. In quotes, He possessed a priceless gift of undisturbed cheerfulness declared a fellow student who knew him very well. Joy was indebitably marked upon his face. It shone from his eyes and appeared in his smile. It was so evident in his every word that he was the delight of his companions. His fellow students wished that they too were blessed in similar fashion. It seemed as if a ray of heavenly brightness followed him wherever he went, and a fountain of grace and sweetness flowed ever in his heart." End quotes. Everybody held the same opinion. Father Norbert spoke at great length of Gabriel's happy disposition and singled out two points for special mention. That his conversation delighted all, and that he had a genius for winning the confidence of others. His charity was not confined to words. He was everybody's friend and helper. If he were free and saw that anyone needed assistance in a task, he offered his help immediately. The charity that knows limits is not true charity, he said, and he lived up to the spirit of his words. It is a simple truth to say his charity knew no bounds. Not that he had much to give as material aid, but what he had he gave with all his heart. When accosted by a beggar on the road, Gabriel explained that he had no money, but he always said a Hail Mary that the poor man might soon meet someone both willing and able to help him in his distress. If he could not give material assistance, Gabriel took the opportunity to offer spiritual aid. In simple words suited to simple hearts, he taught the poor to bear willingly the burdens of poverty. He spoke to them of the poverty of the Son of God and of the sorrows of his beloved Madonna. He reminded them of the sufferings of Jesus and his passion and encouraged them to think of the great reward prepared for the poor in heaven. They continued on their way, not richer in pocket, but immensely richer in soul. For as Father Norbert pointedly observed, their souls were probably more famished than their bodies. Once they met a man who was very disconsolate, apparently with good reason. According to his story, he had been falsely accused, wrongly found guilty on a serious charge, and had served a term of imprisonment. Loudly, he lamented his bitter lot, expecting a goodly measure of sympathy from the listing students. Gabriel looked meaningly at Father Norbert, and the priest nodded to him to take the man aside and talk to him. No one overheard what he said, but Gabriel's earnest words and empathetic gestures made a deep impression on the unhappy man. He resumed his journey, if not exactly more cheerful, at least more resigned to his fate. At home, Gabriel had been generous to a fault. Selfishness was alien to his nature. He gave away his most cherished possessions without a thought. The same spirit of generosity and self-sacrifice inspired his charity in the monastery. Whenever his help was asked, Gabriel agreed so readily and so pleasantly that he appeared to be receiving a favor instead of conferring one. In quotes, He did everything with such joy and cheerfulness, said one, that it seemed to be by his own choice and for his own pleasure. End quotes. 
His resolutions, precise and detailed, show again that theory and practice went hand in hand. In quotes, To rejoice at the good which comes to others when I feel displeased or envious about it, to note that as a fault. To practice kindness and charity, and to do so effectively by help and service. To assist my companions as far as possible with friendly words and manner, but at the same time to have no particular friendships and thus to hurt none. Not to speak roughly or impatiently or in such a way as to cause offense. Not to oppose or contradict anyone. Not to misjudge anyone, but instead to try to excuse their faults and failings, both to myself and others, fostering and showing a good opinion of all. End quotes. Gabriel had a sharp eye, and very little escaped his notice. Brother Charles, who spent two years with him at Isola, remembered one very curious incident. In quotes, One day, Father Gabriel thought I had not heard Mass, he recalled, because he saw me leave the church in haste before Mass was over, as I had to attend to my duties. He hurried after me to the kitchen to remind me about it. I was able to assure him that I had not missed Mass. He was pleased and said, That's good. You know, there are some obligations that are binding in conscience on religious, too. The very simplicity of Gabriel's life is apt to be deceptive. During the years of formation, little opportunity is given to any young religious to stand out from amongst his fellows. All must be cast in the same mold, all must conform to the common pattern, and anything like originality or initiative is not encouraged. In quotes, the educative method, then generally used in monasteries, and especially in passionist monasteries, says Father Casimir Lorenzetti, left little margin for individual initiative, for self-development, for the revealing of personality. Young passionist students had to keep their eyes cast down. They were not permitted to look anyone in the face, not even their own companions. Thus, no one could see the light that shone in Gabriel's eyes. During time of recreation, they were not allowed to speak with whom they pleased, but only with the companion assigned by the superior, and always in subdued tone of voice. The common life was regulated by precise rules and an exact timetable, which all followed in complete silence. No room was left for originality, either in the way of folding the table napkin in the refectory, or in holding the hands concealed in the sleeves, or in the way of walking down a corridor. This immediately draws across a kind of thick curtain, impenetrable to the sharpest eyes, behind which the appearance of the individual religious is concealed from view. It speaks volumes for Gabriel's incandescent personality that while is conforming perfectly to the demands of the common life, he is shown out in the midst of his companions. It is fascinating to catch here and there a fleeting glimpse of his old irrepressible self, of his basic buoyant character that had made him such a general favorite in Spoleto in bygone days. Years afterwards, as Father Norbert tried to recall the fugitive impressions of the past, Gabriel's unsuspected quality stood out vividly in the old man's memory. In retrospect, the picture is still clear and compelling. In quotes, He was naturally very talkative, in a friendly way to be sure, always well-spoken and very much to the point, and always in such a pleasant way that everybody liked to listen to him. When speaking, he avoided useless or trivial topics. Indeed, I thought him specially gifted in this way. He had a cultured voice, but without affection. On certain occasions, he was well able to flavor his talk with a touch of salt, a certain piquancy, a delightful touch of humor, but I never noticed him say anything common or ridiculous, end quotes. Such brief pen pictures bring Gabriel vividly to life again and enable us to see him as he appeared to his contemporaries. They are the only means now available, for unfortunately no authentic likeness of Gabriel was made during his lifetime. It is true that in his day, photography was a new, cumbersome, and rather uncertain art. Nor was it usual to allow a religious to have his photograph taken, least of all a passionist. But portraits of all the Pacenti family are available with the sole exception of Gabriel. Once in Spoleto, he wanted to have his photograph taken, but Michael says he was told to postpone the idea. Later on, he never bothered about it again, not even when he left home to enter the passionist. And after that, it was too late. The rather idealized pictures of St. Gabriel and his passionist habit do not always do him justice. Father Norbert has left this detailed description of his appearance as he remembered him. In quotes, Gabriel was of medium height. His face was rather round and faintly colored. The skin was very pale. His hair was chestnut brown. He had dark, large eyes, so lively and expressive that they seemed like two lovely stars. His whole countenance showed a perennial smile. It was attractive and devout. His lips were not heavy, his chin rounded, but not too prominent. In his last years, he was rather thin and emaciated. End quotes. The most popular picture of St. Gabriel was painted by Professor Grandi from detailed descriptions of those who knew him best. It was submitted to Father Norbert for approval, but his comment was, Oh, the dear servant of God was much more handsome. 
how Gabriel would have smiled at the remark had it been made in his hearing.